you're always supposed to like have goals and stuff like that, but it's really romantic to, you know, it's like don't talk about it, be about it. And I, f I feel like that hopefully if you're always chasing your passion, you're going to find that one thing that makes you want to work harder than you would ever want to work in any other job. Appreciating people and being like genuinely good to them, right. not just like surface level right, good to right, them. Right. Uh, that has gotten me more jobs than my talent has. <laughs> I'm just a nice person, and people are like, I want to keep the nice guy around, you know? Right. Way before I was good at anything, I was getting jobs for being nice. Right. I also really do enjoy making people happy, uh, especially with the world the way it is today. It's like you never know who's on, who's down here and who's up here. And, you know, if we can make everyone, with what I say, just be on the same level, for 10, 15, 20 minutes, that's awesome. Right. The center is the customer. They're the ones who are paying for everything. I just saw this as, oh my God, this is like my chance. Quarter of a million dollars, it was almost surreal. You can't just cut out one person in the supply chain in order to solve a problem. Those are the kind of people you want. You respect them, their integrity, their intelligence, their ability, their can-do attitude, hard work. Welcome to the fourth installment of UC Santa Barbara's Winter 2017 Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm John Greathouse, and you can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. We have with us tonight Mike Falzone. Mike is an impresario. I've wanted to use that word for so long. He's an impresario. He is a Renaissance man. He has cobbled together multiple careers, uh, as you will see in a moment, and really turned them into quite the entrepreneurial endeavor. Mike nearly died twice in about a two-week period. Sandwiched in between there, he was fired from his job. As he was leaving the hospital after his second near-death experience, he decided, I am never going to work for anyone again. Since that day, Mike has written a successful book. He's toured nationally as a comedian and as a musician. He's um, become a YouTube star with over 150,000 subscribers and nearly 19 million views of his videos. Uh, and he has a legion of fans on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, um, which he's used to his benefit strategically. We'll talk a little bit about um, how he's done that. You know, Mike was drawn to YouTube like a lot of folks back in 2006. He was a musician, and he saw it really just as a platform to promote his music. Um, but then he really saw that it was something more than that. And he's turned it into, again, into a career. Um, I like something that Mike said, and we're going to explore it um, when we talk in a minute here. He said he went from working harder in, in his journey of learning how to work smarter. And I think that's a journey that a lot of you are going to be on pretty soon, as well as the hundreds of thousands of people watching this on, on their computers. Oftentimes, when you start your journey, you think, if I just work harder, if I just put in more hours, if I just try a little harder, everything's going to change for me. And sometimes stepping back and asking yourself, how can I work smarter? How can I actually think about what I'm doing instead of just doing more of the same? How can I do something strategically um, and make a huge advancement in your career? We'll talk about that um, with Mike as well. I've, I've had that same issue of working harder and then learning to work smarter. So Mike is a wonderful example of taking that, that sphere of things you love to do and matching it up with things that you can do and make money and pay the bills and meshing those together and really building a career um, and living the life that he wants to live, not the life that uh, maybe others uh, wanted for him. And I want to end with a, a quote from Mike that I think is a wonderful philosophy, um, and I would love for all of you to internalize this thought. Mike said, make other people smile by making yourself happy, and you'll do all right. Let's give Mike a UCSB welcome. Thanks for coming. Well, I just want to tell you, this is one of the hardest working men in show business, and I sent him an email, <laughs> and, and he got back to me within minutes, and he says, I'm there. This was like in November, October or something. I had nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> this is a slow fall. 
<laughs> no, he's like, I'm in, John. Whatever you want, whatever you need. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. I know you, you had to make that trek up from LA and in the rain, and none of that's any fun. But hour we, and a half. We really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys for pretending like you didn't see me over there. <laughs> and clapping. Did you like that big reveal? That was awesome. That was good. And I apologize that you have a sober audience here. That's weird. Yeah, there's. Everyone's sober? Show of hands. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> no one raises their hand. Their parents might be watching. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. It's time to be honest with them. <laughs> Johnny, did you raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lights are really bright. And, uh, I was going to say, are you those don't have a lights going to be on the whole time? They're on the whole time, man. All right. We're going to be able to see this beautiful crowd. and uh, look right at you. They're going to be able to see us. You need to help me. I I'm will. not the most eloquent. I know. I, yeah, I good. Thank God. <laughs> I was born. <laughs> no. So I met Mike years ago, and um, I've always felt sort of a kinship with him. We hardly ever see each other, but um, there's just sometimes you meet people and you have that feeling. Yeah, we, we had that with, um, I had Stacey Peralta here a couple weeks ago. And you guys remember, he felt that way about George Powell. Like, they met, and it just seemed like there was a connection there, and they ended up working together for, for many years. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned in the um, intro, you are an entrepreneur and a career around a number of different facets. You continue to do that. I think that artists in general are very much entrepreneurs. You're creating something from nothing, mm -hmm. and then you're trying to figure out how to get people to pay for that something. Um, you know, if you don't do that, then you're a starving artist in somebody's basement, and, and nobody ever cares, right? Yeah. That's certainly not what you are. Been all those things. You've been all those things, and not anymore. I still feel like I'm the second thing. You don't feel like I'm the second thing? That's maybe what success is, is if you being from an outside perspective, right. think I'm not the second one, I made it. You made it. <laughs> well, I think point of view is, is worth a lot of IQ points. It really is. Yeah. So if you had that perception of yourself, then you'd probably be impossible to live with, and nobody would want to work with you. Like You collaborate with people all the time, and that probably wouldn't happen. Sure. If you didn't have that hunger, that desire, that energy to, to grow and expand your audience, then you probably wouldn't get anywhere, right? Yeah, so yes. It's a, it's a complacent balance. after a while. Right, it's a yeah. balancing act. So you, you wanted to write a book, and so you decided, well, I don't really have a ton of dough to publish a book, so you did a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, in the process of doing the same thing right now. I had a meeting with a publisher uh, like two weeks ago, and it didn't go how I thought it mm. was going to go. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like either don't do it, wait for somebody else, or do it yourself. So I think I'm just going to do it myself. Just for and a it's book? A different, I mean, it's a different, like, you probably want to talk about different let's things. Talk about Already it. off track. No, First let's go. Question. I'll keep you on track. Um, but it's like, there is a thing about being, uh, I'm in the stage of my career right now where I'm trying to be uh, an established stand-up. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to get credits, right? You gotta be like the guy from The Thing. You have to be the guy who's on the TV show right, or right. you have to have something that people recognize you from. Right. And I think publishing- The thing that book, you're gonna run away from the rest of your career. That's the right? one. The dynamite. Like right? the weird, yeah, the weird, whatever I have like a catchphrase right, or something right, embarrassing. Right. That's what I need. <laughs> that thing to run away from. <laughs> right. Um, but like uh, being able to be a published author as compared to like a self-published, which uh, was very rewarding, but it's it's somebody else like placing a validation on you that the right. rest of the world can see and be like that company thought you were good enough right. to do this, you know. But there's a lot of crappy books that get published. There's mostly crappy right. books. I don't know if you've read all the books. I've read all of them, and <laughs> a lot of so them are many. crap. <laughs> no, but for you, I think I, I like that validation even more, that you went out into your community, and you said, I've got this idea. I want to write a book. What do you guys think? And mm -hmm. people gave you the money. They said, we believe in you, and we want to read that book, and they gave you the money to yeah. publish it. And the thing is, like, they're going to see it regardless, right? Like, even if somebody publishes it, they're still going to be the people who are going to buy it. Right. Either it's going right. to come directly from me or through a company. I guess it's just you want like the validation of the outside company just so other people seeing sure. it from the outside thinks it bigger than it is. Right. Or like help in expanding your reach to people who would just pick up the book who haven't seen any videos or anything else that I've done. Right, and that's the beauty of having these multiple irons in the fire mm -hmm. that, that you have. The book's called Never Shut Up, um, Never Stop Shutting Never Up, stop excuse shutting me. Up. I should stop shutting up. <laughs> I don't even, I still don't know what that means. Never stop shutting up. And it's really yeah. funny. I mean, you have all these, and some of the vignettes you've done, you've done videos. Yeah, they're like an expanded upon right. version of some of the videos. Right, how to get kicked out of a band part two. And mm. all, this. all the important <laughs> stuff. All the important stuff. You've sold t-shirts, are you still doing that? Yeah. Where you come up with the, with the, the little catchphrases? Yeah, yeah, it's just nice. If people uh, watch you every week, I always try to, um, 
anything that I do like strategically business wise, right. I always kind of base off of like what I would like if I was watching that person. Mm -hmm. Like if I was a fan of me and right. I watched my videos You're not? every I wouldn't watch my videos every week, I don't think, that much, <laughs> you know. Looking at this head every week right, for right, years. Right. Um, but I would eventually, if I had been watching me for like five, six years, I'd be like, I want to go to school with a T-shirt mm -hmm. that is that dude T-shirt. Right. Same thing with a book or same thing with a hat or whatever. Well, that's the cool thing about you get a shirt like that, and then there's that one person that's like, dude, like they get it, right? Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. they get it. Not yeah. they. What is that? It's like Mike, right? People tweet me about that all the time because yeah. it's yeah. such like a niche. I have that with wrestling fans. But there are millions of wrestling fans, and I'm like, oh, you didn't have any friends in high school either, right? Right, right. And then we both have that thing. <laughs> but both then, that <laughs> but then if you're like, oh, Mike Falzone T-shirt, that's so specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that my favorite is I, I said this to you in my email. Like my my favorite is still I've never been a lifeguard. It's yeah. so random. Yeah, but, but it's, it's like made like all the. Because you go to New Jersey or you right. go to like, I'm the sure fake there's, life a, closer, <laughs> there's yeah. a closer example than New Jersey. Right. But if you Venice go like, Beach. on the pier, anyway, yeah. everything says like, Venice Beach lifeguard. It's right. like, dude, you've never been there. <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> I'm looking at you and you, you weren't a lifeguard. You build for it. So you have had these twists and turns. You went and then you went into, you never left music, but then you did more of the YouTube, more of the vlogging, mm -hmm. the, the walkie talkie stuff, the walking around. We'll talk about a couple mm -hmm. of those videos. Um, and now comedy is the central core of what you're of what you're going after. Do you feel like that's all been very natural? Yeah. In the way that that's evolved, or they say like any comedy books you read or any like veterans that you talk to, they'll say like it's at minimum 10, 15 years to find your voice. And, nice. Like, to become an adult and and to be able to like, comedy is is sharing your unique perspective on you know, uh, shared experiences and, mm -hmm. and your observations and stuff like that. So to have any of that that's worth a damn, you gotta go through some shit, you know? And I always feel like, I tell people that I was a musician for 15 years to figure out that I was a comedian. <laughs> it was a very natural thing. It's like I wrote all these songs about why girls didn't like me because I was an only child and I had no one to just regular talk to it about. <laughs> so I was like, maybe if I find a guitar and I whine about it, people will care more. And they did for a little bit, yeah. for a small time. Uh, He's being humble. Check out this song. He's a very talented Some of them are fine. Yeah, yeah. No, they're good. If you like discovering a new <laughs> musician where you can look at years of a catalog <laughs> and be like, some of those are all right, <laughs> then that's how you want to spend your night tonight, for sure. <laughs> um, no, but it was fun. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take back any of those experiences. And there were, I was talking about this the other day, there were years where I would there's 365 days in a year, and you can look at my MySpace, like back, uh, uh, not back catalog, but like the shows, yeah. like it keeps all the record of the shows. Right. There were years where I did like 250, 300 shows, just like sitting in the corner of some deli, whatever, wow. playing my songs and cover songs to myself. And like you build, that builds something after a while. It might not be exactly, like I'm not like, you know, uh, uh, I'm not Bruno Mars, right? Yeah. I really can't think of a better thing than Bruno Mars right now. I'm not. Uh, I don't know, man. Whatever. But I'm. You're no what Beyonce. I am now. <laughs> right. Sure. Uh, but eventually, what happened was I was like, I can get all these ideas and observations out through just talking. Right. And I could take away the shield. Uh, you know, you're always kind of with the protected. guitar. Yeah, a lot of musicians say that. And it's like, I could strum the last chord of a song and you and everybody else knows that it's the end of the song. So regardless of whether or not you loved it or you liked it or whatever, you're gonna clap and yeah. that's gonna be. Or I could talk about what I wanna talk about from my own unique perspective and give it to you and either you can give me the you know belly sensation of like, either you laugh or you don't. Mm -hmm. And so it's very like, I'm very East Coast when it's like, tell me if I'm good or tell me if I'm not, don't give me this like right. Hollywood bull where it's like, no, we like it, we're gonna keep you around and then we'll not do anything. Right. You know, so comedy is that. It's like you say something, either you laugh or you don't. And uh, I think that's what I was working towards this whole this whole time. Have you, and I've watched your stand up, again, it's very funny, but I haven't seen you, and if you've done this, correct me, incorporating music into it. So if you ever- I used to when I first started When you first did to. some of the early stuff, but I'm, like Jack Black did it, you know, mm -hmm. and then he ran away from it. But you know Bo Burnham, like he's, he yeah, does it man. like that amazingly well. 
he's not even a human being. I know. <laughs> he, what, it didn't take him 13 years. Like, what the hell? No, right? but his brain is just different. Yeah, it he's fires. A beautiful, he's a beautiful brain. So have you thought about... <laughs> beautiful, sexy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we got issues here. Skinny. <coughs> um, skinny brain. Have you thought about that, though, now that you've sort of... Come, I'm not giving you career advice, but just no, no, I mean, you, I'll take it, man. You got you're the, still, you're, you're a very like, talented musician. You did, and you sort of did that arc, and now you're, you, you've got your voice in comedy. Do you see those coming together at some point? Not I'm the sure, Jack Black, I mean, like, like silly stuff, but like bringing even it. Even that, like, if, if I could write a silly song, my problem with my comedy songs where they were all about like, like sex and stuff, and like really blue, really easy stuff. Mm. Blue is like when you talk about like and stuff like that. Make sure you bleep that out. Don't let this get through. Absolutely <laughs> not on the internet. Absolutely not. But they were all about that, and so they're all kind of like easy right. shock value, right, whatever. Right, right. And you're going to hear a word, and you're going to laugh, and then I'm going to give you a misdirection at the end. You're going to laugh, whatever. Right, right, right. If I could talk about the things that I'm talking about now and make it in a way where I would be excited to do it every single night, then I might try it again. I think, I think you, I mean, I think the whole Bo thing, not you want to copy him, but just that whole like taking you in different directions, yeah. not doing obvious stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I think you could totally, you already do that with your comedy. I think you could totally do that musically anyway. Well, I'll get I off to this point. That. Dude, another thing is like my last song that I wrote is called uh, You and Me, and I worked with a friend of mine, a really cool producer, his name is Jeremy Hatcher, and I, it's like, I, the song was like my goodbye to music uh, after all these years. It was kind of like a breakup song with music. Right. And I think it's the greatest song I've ever written. Nice. So now I just want to be like, see ya. <laughs> it was wow. perfect. Imagine if you broke up with someone <laughs> and right before you break up, you say the greatest thing you ever said. Like, do you want to see that person in like a CVS? That would like, ruin no. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I already said that. Right, you don't want to come out with like an okay song after the best one. Right, right, right. Look at U2. Everyone so, was like, why the hell is U2 on my iPhone for right. whatever reason? So like the, Beatles, <laughs> like the Beatles, you left music on top. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> on Just top. like that. Yeah, the 500 people who heard the last song I wrote. <laughs> that was, I was like, you guys enjoy this. I'll see you later. <laughs> We're going to go to the student in one second. Um, so you, you talk about working harder versus working smarter. Um, I love that you got to, and you said you would get there earlier to the basketball court, and I believe yeah. you, because I know that you got to Uncle Mike's at like nine, even though you knew you, was gonna, you were going to go on at midnight or one in the morning, yeah. and the, other, yeah, the rest yeah. of the band's like, why are we here, Mike? And you're like, because we have a job to Dude, do. Dude, they hated me. I call them as a grown man, and I apologize for them sometimes. <laughs> Because I had these two other dudes who were in a band with me a couple years ago, and I would just like, I wasn't a, a jerk to them, but I would, I would drag them around everywhere because I was the guy who was like, this is the dream, yeah. and at least one of us has to work this hard right. for us to get any real whatever. Right. And they were kind of just like, we want to play music with our best friends, and they took that for as long as they could. And then I think I was like, guys, go do... Please. Just go do anything. And they didn't put up a fight at all, but I was like, go live your lives. I'm so sorry for <laughs> dragging you from Connecticut to New York, you know, uh, How every often, Thursday. As you say, was it once a week? Oh, it would be at least once a week, and we wouldn't go on before, like, we would get there at, like, 9 and get drunk, and then we wouldn't go on before, like, 12 at right. least, right. or right. one or but two. But you were the house band, weren't you for we that? We had a residency, okay. which just Sorry. meant it was us and 13 other bands Got it. that were awful, Got it. that you had to suffer through every <laughs> night. And it was bad. it was a grind. Yeah. And, but it was like being from Connecticut and not really having any kind of, uh, there was like, there are smaller scenes, but then right. like you know everybody and you want to go play somewhere else. Yep. We thought being from Connecticut, we had to be in New York. You know, it's the only way we're going to get seen by anyone. Yep. No one gets seen by anyone in, in Chelsea Connecticut. at 1 o'clock right. in the morning. Right. Uh, but we figured that out after a couple of years of doing it. And, and plus again, you had like, to be able to answer that question that everybody on the East Coast asks you if you're in that part of the world and you're in a band. Do you play the city? You're yeah, like, yeah, the city, and everyone knows which city you're talking right, about. Right. And then you come out here and you're like, right. "This city, you're like, yeah. uh, weirdo." There are thousands <laughs> of cities. It's crazy. You could be in like a three, four state radio and say yeah. the yeah. city. Yeah, if you if you say New York, people are like, "Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah." He yeah. doesn't know. Yeah, no clue. It's the city, Stanford, Connecticut. <laughs> so, how did you get from? Can you give us some examples of the harder to smarter? That was one of kind of saying, "Okay, we're not going to beat our heads." That's the biggest one. Is like investing yeah. so many hours in travel to the same place doing the same thing over and over again playing the same, same people results. or no one right right mm -hmm. 
So I know in my, in my experience, there's actually someone that spoke here a couple years ago, Jason Nazar, you guys, he was a former UCSB class president, very smart guy, been very successful. Um, I was talking to him one time, we were talking about my writing, and he said, because I was kind of working harder, it was like working harder, not smarter, mm -hmm. and he just said to me, and it was just like, you know, hit me at the right moment, he's like, think about the one thing you can do tomorrow to advance your writing, not the 15 things, the one thing, and it made me really and think. And to move forward, not just to like to forward. get another thing out. So I ended up, that led me to getting a gig at Forbes, which I've had for four years now. And you know, not that that's like the end of the world and like I'm a, a best-selling author, but it really upped my viewer. I've had millions of views now on Forbes. It mm -hmm. really raised my profile. Even like name association for like casual conversation. Exactly. Because like when you interviewed me, I was telling some of your students like I really didn't. Maybe I have like seven thousand subscribers, but we for whatever reason hit it off. Yep. And you wanted to interview me, and then people still talk about it with like if they don't know my stand-up credits, really. Really. Like you wrote about them in Forbes, nice. and like it might be an internet article or whatever. Right, but they're like it got a decent number of views. In oh the, yeah, in the, no, it did the video really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank you for that. You're welcome for taking a chance. It was a hilarious interview. I really enjoyed nice, it. Nice. I, I only put like an excerpt on there, but it was. It yeah, was I didn't put any of the funny stuff in there. <laughs> All the funny but stuff. But you gotta trust me. I didn't want him to show me <laughs> up, so I kept editing his funny stuff out. No, but that's an example from my life of just you know taking that moment to work smarter. Like I was cranking on my blog and getting yeah. like no readers and all this stuff. And then suddenly I got a platform that led to the Wall Street Journal and Inc and Entrepreneur and all these other things. Awesome. So, so that's, I think what I would invite you guys to think about is t take a breath, pull, you know, stop for a second and just think about what is the one thing I can do this week or the one thing I can do this month that'll really take me, not the 15 things, the one thing that'll take me to that next level. And you may have to think about it. It may not be obvious. Yeah. And there's like, there's, it really is that like, that's the important part of the sentence is the moving forward, right. progressing. Right. You know, because you could do a million things like even on YouTube, like I can make a million of the same type of video and hope yep. that it did as well as the one that blew up or whatever. Right. But what am I going to do at the end of the day or in five years if I'm not trying to be something that will lead me to more right. opportunities? You know, and it's like there's always Beyonce is the easy example. But like, I got to work with The Rock for a little while mm -hmm. recently, and there's always something. Were you like his bodyguard? Or? Yeah, I was his bodyguard. <laughs> like over here, Dwayne. <laughs> it's safe over here, Dwayne. Um, but like, there's that dude is just flying around doing things constantly, right. and like he doesn't sleep. It's crazy, and so, you know, I can get tired one week and be like, I'm gonna take Thursday and do nothing right but there's always something that you could do to move forward on thursday instead of doing and, that. but sometimes it's better to take that rest oh yeah absolutely get revitalized i'm still not good at like you know this is the break weekend or what i say right. yes to right. everything right. Until I'm mad you're the kid that showed up 10 minutes early man yeah and you're the kid that's got the mics at nine super good at foul shots but <laughs> nothing else can't pass to save his life in a game situation but we'll take the, the, the next foul. student's question hey mike hi so YouTube has grown to become a huge platform for people to share their creative endeavors in video form. Um, so where do you draw your inspiration to like stand out from all the other videos out there? Um, I try not to like compare myself to anybody else. I watch some of my friends sometimes, but I don't watch a ton. I watch stuff that has like nothing to do with me. Like I watch people play video games and stuff. Uh, just so I could like, I don't know, man. I, I don't really, I think I heard John Mayer say something like this in an interview like this, where he was at some college. So I'm having a weird like full circle moment right now. But uh, he said something like create compared to nothing, right? And I guess in our minds, we're always gonna like be, this is kind of like this or whatever. But when I make stuff, I don't really say like, I kind of make YouTube videos compared to nothing. <clears throat> and stuff that I would watch that isn't necessarily already out there if I was just a fan. Like, it all goes back to that stuff, too. Um, and I, the best inspiration is just, like, putting yourself in different life situations that you wouldn't normally. It's like saying yes to that thing that you don't necessarily want to go to because you're tired, but you don't know if, like, you might get a good story out of it or, like, you go just to mess with people or whatever. Uh, not coming up with any great examples right now. But it's like, you know, you're too tired to go to the store, and then you're like, what could happen? I'm gonna go to the store. And then you go and something crazy happens. Or you just make an observation or you think about something just because you're in a different space in a different way than you 
you know, would normally think about it. And that turns into like a tweet or a joke or a song or whatever. You just never know where you're gonna pick stuff up. But if you like are just in your house at all times, which it's super easy and comfortable to do and like that's where all the food is. <laughs> But uh, eventually, like you're, you just kind of fall asleep, you know, and you stop making like new and exciting stuff, and you just make what you're used to and what you're comfortable for. So just challenge yourself and put yourself in different weird positions. I think that's the best inspiration. So I, I have uh, a different way of saying some, something similar, which I, I recommend to young people, especially within reason, mm -hmm. and that's be a yes. So so pick a day where pretty much no matter what somebody says to you within reason, yeah, you go okay. Yes, yeah. and I, I was talking to somebody that did that and all of these things opened up and he's like, I wasn't gonna go to like this bar mitzvah, I just didn't wanna deal with it, mm -hmm. it was like a distant relative and then this happened and I'm so glad I went. So sometimes when you go with that mentality of a yes, you just open to whatever's gonna happen. Yeah. You know, you're not going in with a dark cloud over your head or like a martyr, you're it's just like, so easy. I'm in, let's do it's it. It's so easy, like there's always a million reasons not to do something, exactly. I heard that somewhere yeah. and that's like so true. The the. Uh, music producer who taught me the whole working smarter mm -hmm. as opposed to working harder thing, I met at a show that I didn't even want to be a part of, of course. at all. I was like, no one's going to go here and blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, like, I'm kind of half in and half out, so I'm playing my songs and making people laugh to, just to keep myself, like, right. in it. <laughs> right, right. And next thing you know, like, this big, tall, blonde Swedish lady comes up to me and it's his wife, and she's like, my husband wants to talk to you. I was like, we're in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I'm not having this experience right, right. here. And she's like, yeah, he found the Jonas Brothers and he, uh, Katy Perry and all that, and now he wants to talk to you. And I'm like, dude, I'm... I'm halfway out here. There's a pizza place next door, and then I'm going home to play video games <laughs> the rest of the night, and you're screwing all that up. <laughs> With but, your success. Right, but you never know like where you're going to, like right. if I didn't go there, right. I don't know, you know, I'm sure my life would be similar, but different. Well, there was something you said to me um, earlier that I, I really liked. I think it's very germane for young people trying to find their way, and that's not just like this sort of working harder, smarter thing. One part of working smarter is learning the jobs of those people around you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think, I don't know, for whatever reason, they're too good or they don't care, they're not curious, they don't, they, but if you wanna be a comedian, for instance, man, it helps to know, like, how does the club, how does the club person get paid? Like, yeah. how does the booking agent get paid? How does- How do you time out a show? All of that stuff. Yeah. And so if you can learn, this is something that you guys can apply to any career. If you can learn the importance and the, and the you're not gonna be an expert, but learn how other people around you do their job, you're gonna be better at your job. And it's you're gonna one, appreciate how they do their job and, and help them yeah. help you. Well, two things. It's like appreciating people and being like genuinely good to them, right. not just like surface level right, good to right, them. Right. Uh, that has gotten me more jobs than my talent has. <laughs> I'm just a nice person and people are like, I wanna keep the nice guy around, you know? Right. Way before I was good at anything, I was getting jobs for being nice. Right. And like it just makes you more valuable. It adds value to you if you know. Like you could be replaced in a second if you do something, even well, but people don't like you. Right. Like, totally. Get out. But it's not just that. I mean, you're being humble again. I, I, you are a nice guy, and you have empathy for other people. Thank but you. I need but you, those. but you get better at, at at what you're doing when you understand how it dovetails with somebody else. Like if I don't understand how the director here works, and I'm like moving my chair, and I'm doing all these crazy things that are mm -hmm. not good on camera, that's gonna make. It's going to make me look not as not as professional up here. It's going to make the director's job harder. Right. We're not going to want and to like work you together. Know what's going on. Right. But then if you do, you're like. I can put up a facade that appears that <laughs> I that I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> so I mentioned your philosophy, which I had to I had to put in the in the intro there about making other people smile by making yourself happy. Mm -hmm. You're a comedian, dude. You're supposed when to be. When did I say that? Where was what was that from? Oh, awesome. It's good. Yeah. No, I got, I got it off the internet. You engrave it on something. Yeah, I say a lot. Of Put it on a mug. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna put my name under it. Give me a piece of that. So, Papa likes paying rent. <laughs> but the thing about I that is- I also call myself Papa. I know, that was weird. That's cool with everybody. <laughs> I don't believe you even have children, so that's really weird. I don't, not, I'm practicing. That you know of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we can say that because we're on a college campus. Good. Um, but you're, dude, you're a comedian, so you can't say things like that. Like, you can't <laughs> let that get out. You're supposed to be bipolar, angry, yeah. Alcoholic, probably. You're the same type Horrible of parents. Else. Yeah, yeah. And yet you had a supportive parents. You have supportive parents. Mm -hmm. How do you think you're ever going to succeed in comedy? <laughs> you just don't have the stuff. Um, 
I'm trying to go through the Rolodex of like things that I, I should not say on your show. Come on. Um, no, but seriously, when you talk to other comedians, you're in that world. Mm -hmm. Is that a stereotype or is that sort of reality? Is there a lot of confusion well, I mean, and angst? Everyone's in and... comedy because they're, they're broken to a certain extent. And I wouldn't totally exclude myself from that. But I also really do enjoy making people happy mm -hmm. because I, and I'm sure I'll be at other points, but when I got really sick, like I was, that was the lowest point in my life. Like I could, I could talk about the hour that I would consider the lowest hour in my life. So I know that that exists. I know that I'd never want to be back there again. I know that I might someday when I'm older. Like right. I have this, sure. this is depressing, but it's kind of, it helps all the happy stuff. I have this thing in my life where I'm like, <clears throat> I was in the hospital when I was 26, 25, 26, whatever it was, and that was the lowest point in my life. And then at the end of your life, like I've seen so many relatives, it's like you go back to the hospital and you yep. either come out or you don't. Right, you know? right. And my whole thing is like, I never want to go back there for any reason. So while I'm here and while I'm anywhere but in there, I'm going to do whatever I can to make myself happy and to mm -hmm. make other people happy. Right. And it's not like a, maybe that's why I don't know that as like a t-shirt slogan. It's just because like that's the way I live my life. It's common sense. You know, it's like you could, and other people, you never know. Everybody who walks into the club, it's like you never know what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, especially with the world the way it is today, it's like you never know who's on, who's down here and who's up here. And, you know, if we can make everyone, with what I say, just be on the same level for 10, 15, 20 minutes, that's awesome. Right. You know? Yeah, I know you said that about your videos at one time. It's like, if I can get somebody's attention, I gotta give them something for that attention. If well, they're gonna taking, watch my video. Yeah, I'm taking six right. minutes that you'll never right. get back. Right. So I might as well help you enjoy that. Right. Or make that, make the transition from doing whatever you wanted to do to right. watching my stuff as easy as possible. Or sell a t-shirt while you're at it. Or sell a t-shirt. <laughs> Just a six minute commercial about a t-shirt. <laughs> we'll, we'll take the next uh, student's question. Uh, hey, Mike. Hey, man. Um, so last year you were nominated for a Shorty Award, funniest YouTube comedian. Yes. Um, so what exactly? It's kind of an open-ended question. By the way. Didn't get it. <laughs> um, so what exactly nominated? does nominee? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what exactly does being funny mean to you? Uh, kind of a general question, but. Um, I always wanted to be funny, like when I was younger. I don't think I was legitimately funny until I was like 27, and I'm 32 now. So. You know how you all have a friend who are like, all right, man, turn it off for like two seconds. That's enough. No one wants to hear it. That was me <laughs> for like 26 years. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, so I just like it a lot. I like being able to make people smile. I like knowing that somebody's kind of like having a day and then like I could say something and it was like they never told you they had a day or maybe they had a day yesterday, but today's all right. You know, that's nice. Uh, it's, it's really important for me, man. It's like uh, people are so stressed out for so many different reasons, and I like being the buffer, you know? It's like we don't have to talk about the stuff that depresses us all the time. You could have five minutes where you watch a video or you go see stand-up and, you know, everyone's laughing. It's like you're, when you have a really good night at the club, or even the nights when like seven people show up, but everyone's laughing at the same thing. It's like you're just hanging out with friends. You're not allowed to talk because I'll kick your ass out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you're hanging out with like this group of friends and you all get the same inside joke. Like it's a really nice, like it's like, it's wearing a blanket. It's a really nice, like cool, comfortable thing. Do you use nights like that just to work on material? Oh God. You yeah. sort of just go, okay, I'm not doing my real routine here. I'm just gonna sort of riff it mm -hmm. and see what works. I'm very lucky to this point, like over the past, five years, I have my like 15 minutes that I know I could do and like not think about yeah, right. and it'll work, right, you right, know? Right. And that's good because if there are nights when things aren't working, I have things <laughs> that do work. Uh, but yeah, I love But you know, once you do out. your Netflix special, you're not gonna be able to do that anymore. Oh, I'll never People are gonna start booing. Else. They're gonna be like, dude, dude if I get to the that one. <laughs> yeah, do the, uh, the oh, what about yeah, the yeah. chicken. Do the chicken stuff. Uh, I bought my ticket for the chicken stuff. You know, like Steve Martin said that in his autobiography. Yeah. He did like 15 years of the same jokes, and then he was on Saturday Night Live or and Tonight like Show or something. And, then, <laughs> and people were like heckling him, like, do something new. And he's yeah. like, this is all I got. I went to Fairfield University, and we had Dave Chappelle 
doing this amazing stand-up, and we like, this is before the Chappelle show, before right, all this right. stuff, and people were like, do that line from Half Baked, and I was like, yo, idiot white kid, really? you're messing up right. so bad right now. <laughs> that line from Half Baked. It was bad, oh, it was so bad, because he's up there, this is like right before the Chappelle show, which is arguably like yeah. the pinnacle of his career, maybe, yep. Yep. and we got him, and he's just right here, right. and he's saying that, he's like, I'm here, like go back to your dorm room, and watch the DVD if you want, but I'm here right now. Right, exactly. What a wasted opportunity. <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, as soon as I get that Netflix special, I'm, I'm, You'll have to come up with new jokes. I will never come up with a new joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hate myself forever. You'll be the old guy in a chair, let me do that special for yeah. you. <clears throat> How do you deal with hecklers, Lisa, when you get- Oh, that's my, I shouldn't say this shouldn't oh, be Oh, because people internet. will, they'll know your secret Yeah, power. and then you become like, I have friends who are like heckler comedians, like my friend Steve does the Laugh Factory all the time, and he has all these videos on YouTube because he's just smart of him destroying hecklers because heckling is a stupid thing yeah, to do, right. and you're heckling a smart person. Right, it might be a right. damaged, like right, sad right, person, right. but that's a smart human. They're up yeah. there in a specific building for a reason. Right, it's not because right. they're bad and dumb. Slow. You're right. <laughs> um, they'll get you fast before you even know like what is happening. So um, one of my last headlining spots, I was doing 15 minutes, and I just remember like, bless you. I've been doing like seven minutes over and over again, and like I got myself, but I want to try new stuff, so I need a longer set to try stuff. And I was like, I'm so excited. I have like seven things that I'm going to try, which is too many. <laughs> and then I got up there, and this one girl, it was the end of the night when the headliner goes, <clears throat> and she was just like wasted, and she was with her boyfriend. She was just not even good, just like yelling. Right. Shit out. Like she was like, yeah. where's the candy? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So there's nothing you can even say. Right, right. Like, what am I going to say? It's not even funny. Right, check under your seat. I <laughs> yeah, don't know. Right, right. And so I had to talk to her. And like the dude who booked the show, God bless his heart, was like coming around. You could see him like coming around her chair like, we could throw her out if you want to <laughs> actually tell a joke. Right, right. Like, no, leave her, man. She's not. She's the only one. Everybody else is kind of enjoying it. But isn't there like a, so I remember um, like, a, it was Cheech or Chong. When Cheech and Chong were talking about hecklers, and they said you got to let them annoy the crowd before you before you pounce on them. Like yeah. let them be annoying enough, <clears throat> and then go okay. Yeah, I'm, if I'm you're gonna, gonna send you. them out, yeah. they have to be like everyone has to want that. Right, right. But like, then you get the cheery. Right, and, like, and I'm not like a real mean person on the surface. <laughs> <laughs> but me and my friends, and I'm sure some of you had this too in high school. Like we we only cut up on each other. Right, and I, I right. come from you know. We were all uh, just pretty mean East Coast kids yeah. who like didn't say anything nice to each other. Right, it ever. Was like, Why would you? The most popular one was the one that could uh, like disarm your right. sh that you say about right. them first. Right. Yep. You know. Yep. And I grew up a fat kid, so I just have years <laughs> of like <laughs> just going back at people. So if somebody wants to say like a little meek something in the back of a comedy club, like I'm gonna get you, <laughs> and I'm gonna like use and it. And you can kind of enjoy it. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna enjoy it a lot. Because I've been actively trying not to do it since yep. high school, but yep. it's like in your blood. Yeah. So well, like now I get to do this, and everyone's kind of, like on your side. Yeah, they put a target on themselves. Kind of. That's a whole different psychology. Like you're like not drunk. Like, yeah. You why know? would somebody do it? Don't heckle us, please. And all these, it's like when the people fart on an airplane. Like that's terrorism. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like if I want to go back to the East Coast and I spend four hundred and fifty dollars on an airplane ticket, right. and you're gonna fart. No. Do you think they should at least give you notice? Or? No. They should be able to open the window, <laughs> and then you get sucked out at 130,000 miles an hour. Is what should happen. Well, I thought you were going to say they should walk down the aisle and like crop dust everybody. Yeah, and everybody goes shame, <laughs> shame. shame. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's ask you something, a serious question, if I might. Mm -hmm. I know you don't have a crystal ball, none of us do. But what do you think about this contentious relationship between content creators and YouTube? Or, or we can even expand it if you don't want to slam YouTube. Mm -hmm. Anyone that's a platform that lets creators get out there. The money that's flowing to the creators like continues to go down. What do you mm -hmm. think is going to happen there? Are we going to get new platforms? Is, are the payment terms going to change? I don't know, man. I don't know anything about that stuff. I'm just, uh, I'm always like, because I was never the person, I don't do like a million views a month. So I never, I was never like, the majority of my income comes from this, mm, you know? Got it. Um, so I've always been able to be like, what if there's no this tomorrow and be fine with it? But I'm always going to make stuff 
the, the reason I keep making stuff isn't because I get like a minuscule paycheck every month. It's mm -hmm. because like I need to make stuff. It makes me better as a writer to force me to write multiple things a week. Uh, if there's no other jobs going on, because like gig economy and, yep, and yep. permalance, it's like there's always peaks and valleys. You know, December, <coughs> January, you might have, after the boom, like you might have nothing going on for a couple months. And I'll always have that if I keep going. So it's, it's, it serves way more purposes than just like financial. Yep. I never know what's going on with that stuff. So I don't it's care. A, it's like a distribution channel for you, <laughs> and you're happy with that. Yeah. I love to. I saw you get introduced. I'm way more. I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm way more interested in maintaining an audience like that. Because if right, I mean, right. even if I'm getting no money, but there's like 20, 30, 50 thousand people watching each video. Right. When I say at the end of those videos that I'm going on tour, those people mm, are going to show up, even right. if the video is not making money. Got it. You know, I think it's the right way to look at it. I mean, you do hear a lot of content creators complaining about their overlord YouTube and how yeah and about how they money. make. I got twelve uh, cents last month. And, yeah, yeah. Don't. But I did laugh at one of your intros, not to ruin your bit, but <laughs> the guy introduced you as like a YouTube star or something. Yeah. And you're like, I'm the guy on that free service. <laughs> yeah, that's the best when they put YouTube on my poster, like it's a right. credit, like right, it's a stand up right. credit. Like other people have NBC or Netflix. Or yeah, HBO. mine's like, you know that free website? <laughs> he made a video. <laughs> yeah. And he actually posted it. This guy has an email address. <laughs> we'll take the next two. <laughs> You've seen this first guy on Letterman, and this guy has a Hotmail. How's it going? Uh, so many comedians talk about the in the moment uh, humor as being like the most effective. Uh, do you find that to be the case? And if so, what processes have you created to ensure that you're able to get there? Uh, in live performances, kind of like now, how you're just ripping off. Yeah, it's my favorite thing, man. That I think uh, at like the base of that, that all comes from like getting made fun of when you're little, and like not even like a, in a sad way, just like trading back and forth as fast as you possibly can. That's the best, and that's the most fun. And the thing that's the hardest is to like um, work on jokes and to figure out how to tell jokes, and like that's a science and an art, you know, and that takes years and years. But if you're halfway good at like being witty and just being able to, you know, deliver back and forth with people and hold a conversation, one, it endears you to the audience, and two, it kind of, um, if you see a long show, like you can get tired, and it's like here's another person coming up and they're gonna tell jokes and then they're gonna leave, and then they're gonna come up and talk about their like couch observations and then they're gonna leave and whatever, and it becomes a show. But if you just get up and talk about things that are happening in the room right now. Um, that's like when people are like, you know, where do you work or, or what do you do or whatever. It, it snaps everybody out of like we're at a show right, right now. And it's more like, oh, we could all experience this. Like this wasn't written a while ago. Um, and the best performers do jokes that were written years ago, but it seems yeah. like it's yeah. all yeah. being made up right there. So like that's kind of where you want to get to. You know, it's that feeling that it's happening right now. And it's not happening anywhere else but here. So, like, thank God we're all here experiencing this together. That's I actually favorite. wrote an article about it. It's not all about me, but, it, but, <laughs> but I'll make it about me. Your time on the road. My time on the road. <clears throat> no, but about um, it was, uh, you know, what, what um, business people can learn from comedians' presentation techniques. And one of them was some, some young people think that I don't want to over rehearse because I'll sound over rehearse. And it's just the opposite. Yeah. Rehearse the crap out of what you're going to say. And then and work to make it it'll sound spontaneous because you're not like struggling and thinking because you go to a comedy club as you've gone many times mm -hmm. go to a comedy club and watch the same show twice watch you know maybe you have to sit through a couple other acts and the guy or lady comes back out up and watch the wait staff you can tell the new jokes because the wait staff will laugh right mm -hmm. and, but they're like oh this is the most boring show I've ever seen because I just saw it you know an hour and a half ago and yet the audience is cracking up and it sounds super spontaneous. Like, how can that person do that? He's covered up with all of that right yeah. now. And it's, it's even not. more impressive for the waitresses. Because yeah. like, how are you not laughing right now? It's hilarious. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same sort of thing if you're giving a presentation. Practice it so much that it, you can just give it glib. It sounds like it's the first time mm -hmm. you've ever said it. And you're not, you're, you know, you have that hesitancy in your voice that you often have when you're trying to remember what you're yeah. going to say. You, uh, 
I think it's a Jerry Seinfeld thing he was talking about. There's the part of your brain that explains, and there's the part of your brain that recites. Mm. And you always want to work to get it to the explaining part. Like you're just telling somebody a story. As right. soon as it sounds like you're reading off of cards, but yeah. you're just like going from memory, right. like people zone out and stuff like that. I saw a couple people. They zoned already. out? Oh, they zoned out. First five minutes, oh, I saw man. a kid kind of sleeping. Can we put an icon over around. their head, like an emoji? <laughs> it's this with the Sims, Yeah. whatever the Sims yeah. have when they go to sleep. Right. Um, we're going to do that, so be careful. We found you. We found you. Um, so you did a bunch of the... And I know Steve. What if that kid's <laughs> name was Steve? What if that kid's a little bit stoned, and he fell asleep, and his name is Steve? He was like, oh, I got to get out. Why did I take this class? How did, no he know? Like, How did he know? How did he know? You can read minds, right? So you, yeah. Yeah, okay. Try to stay out of their minds for another minute. I will. Know? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. So on your, your walkie-talkie videos where you, know, you, you would vlog with a... Um, with a selfie stick or whatever. Nope. You I would just held the camera. No, you didn't. Everyone was Your arm is at Jack's Dude, length. Come I'm on. 120 years old. I'm way before the selfie stick. I was holding like a camera like that, like a DSLR camera. So that's why you're you're you got the gun. Yeah, I look like a highlight player if I take my clothes <laughs> off. I have one jacked arm. And the, the other, other one's arm, like emaciated. <laughs> looks like a piece of spaghetti. All right, sorry, no selfie sticks involved. You no should have had that like stick. flashing underneath. So <laughs> yeah, no selfie stick. That's sticks. the impressive part of what I'm doing. My arm. He doesn't even have a stick. That long. <laughs> But I like the way you described those. You, you called them, at one point, advice you wish someone had given you when you were young, even yeah. though you wouldn't have listened to it. Yeah. So I think it's a good description at the time. That's like <laughs> half the stuff in college, too. Like well, so these, many things like students. this, man. I feel like, oh, if I had this. It's just you get places, like common sense places, quicker if you learn to like listen in a certain specific way and retain real life advice. Right. Like a lot of stuff goes in one ear and out the other just because you guys hear it constantly. But once in a while you hear like a sentence uh, that just like skips you forward a couple months in your life. And you're like, oh, I won't worry about any of that because that guy said that one thing it, that time. I, I, there's so much truth to that. I mean, I've been doing this for a number of years and I remember when I went to school, the things that I do remember were speakers that came mm -hmm. up. They told anecdotes, they told stories. They talked about, I don't remember what the professor said. Well, you relate it to like, like real life and then it makes sense. And it sticks and it stays in there. And, mm -hmm. and, and I used even some of those things when, when I was in business. Yeah. But did you have a, a mentor besides your parents? Did you have somebody in your life that was giving you advice? Maybe you listened to it or didn't listen to it. I'm always encouraging students to get a mentor. Do you have one now? Uh, no, like, <coughs> the I ghost have of George Carlin? Like, or? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, how awesome if I had like a George Carlin hologram <laughs> right. that I just turned on. Mike, off. let me talk to you about your show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all bad. <laughs> You're kind of stealing from me all the time. Um, yeah. I don't have like a dude who I'm like, or, or anyone who right. I'm like, every Thursday we go and have no. mentor sessions. Right. I wish I did, because I have friends in LA who do do that with like other comedians. Right. Every comedian I would want to do that with wouldn't do it. <laughs> uh, just learning more about my friends as I, as I think about them. Uh, but. Were there people, when there, were there people in your past? Like, I mean, you're a music producer yeah, yeah, yeah. The, or a show, uh, somebody that owned a club or. Yeah, the guy who came up to me at the, at the show I didn't want to be at, his name is Mike Mangini. And he, uh, you know, his, his credits are on everything. I, I think he has a Grammy for Who Let the Dogs Out. So wow. just stay seated. We have him to blame clapping. for that. <laughs> yeah. No, that was, hey man, when that came out, if you were at like a, like a, a minor league baseball game yeah. and somebody played Who Let the Dogs Out while somebody's yeah. shooting t-shirts into the audience, yeah. oh, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I love them out. <laughs> Why are all these triple XL t-shirts? Right, exactly. Um, they gotta make sure they fit is the reason. Yeah. Uh, but he told me a lot of stuff that I, you know, that I carry and that I remind myself. The first woman who taught me comedy in Connecticut, her name was uh, Christine O'Leary, and she was the one who taught me. Dude, I came into her class uh, with seven or eight notebooks. I was like well into YouTube, like vlogging stuff, mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm just gonna translate my videos, whatever, and then I have all these stand-up jokes about like sex and, and drugs and stuff like that, and this is all gonna be funny. It's gonna kill in the bar scene. Right. And she looked at me on the first day and she was like, I just want you to know that just because you're in your 20s and you're white and you're a dude, you don't have to be an <laughs> And so I just took all the books <laughs> and I put them over here and I was like, let's learn from the beginning. Let's like start new. Right. And uh, I hear her voice in my head every time I, I write a joke. 
And uh, that's how you remember the people who teach you like the best stuff. It's like right. you, you literally hear them in your head as you're doing what you love. So she, not to mess up. I mean, she sounds like she was trying to help you find your voice. Like you yeah. had a voice, mm -hmm. right, of, of, of things, derivative things you had sort of ripped yeah. off or And whatever. even at, at that point, I was still performing for like over 10 years at that point, you know? Like smack dab in the middle of like right. you think you kind of know what's going on, but right, right. you never totally know what's well, going on. Well, that's I think that's what mentors can do for you. Like they they've got the perspective. A lot of times they're older. They've been around the block. They've mm -hmm. seen it, and they can give you that that feedback that yeah. you that more people ask me to be like a YouTube or comedy mentor. Oh, really? Charge for it, man. Dude, I well that's another thing. Some kid comes up to you and you're like, I just moved here. I'm 20 years old. Uh, I kind of have nothing, but I would love to just pick your brain. I'm like, okay, 500 bucks. Yeah, you should. There's like, no way. You got a hunter spot? <laughs> yeah. I'm just mugging And then these take kids. it. Go first lesson. Yeah, give me your sneakers. I'll tell you how to <laughs> upload a video. That's a <laughs> deal. Well, it depends on the sneakers. Yeah. We'll, we'll take, <laughs> you make we'll take the, last, the last student's question. <clears throat> Despite starting out as a musician, you branched out into comedy, writing, and even designing t shirts. Uh, how did you pivot into these other fields, and what advice would you give to those that only have their eyes set on one area of expertise to excel in? Um, I always like took it personally when I was doing both and uh, in YouTube at the same time. When people would be like, "You got to pick one, or else no one's gonna. You're not gonna be able to easily explain to people what you do." So, like, I just gave this example to your other students. It's like if I, if you had a YouTube channel where you talk about shoes and he wanted to know about it, and you were like, Mike, what does that kid do? I was like, oh, he talks about shoes on YouTube. You instantly know what he does, so you're gonna go there or not, you know? If I'm telling you about my older YouTube channel, I'm like, well, I do music, I was a musician. Well, it's like, it's like being an alcoholic. Like, I am a musician still, but I don't play music. But like, I like comedy, and like, I'm learning about it, and I'm not good yet, but like, I do funny things. And so you're like, okay, I'm gonna go watch the sneaker, <laughs> you know? It's just, you zone out after a while. Um, but then I was like, it was just such a seamless transition. I literally just got tired of writing songs and I didn't feel the same way about my music shows as I would after a good comedy show. And like, bad comedy show, it's like, that's as close to rock bottom as you could possibly get. But good comedy show is like, I hung out with God for a little while, and he said, everything's fine. Uh, or she, I don't know what's going on up there. Uh, or over there, I don't know where it is. Um, worked myself into a real weird hole on that one. But uh, it just makes it more, I, I think you gotta do as much as possible until you know for a fact that you wanna go one way. You know, you should always be open to a lot of stuff. The more stuff you do, the more experiences you'll have, and you'll have like a bunch of places to draw from the experience that you're putting into like, if you like doing comedy, but you tried to be a cook forever, like you have all those experiences and like lessons that you learned being a cook that you could bring into comedy, like everything, just because you tried to do a bunch of stuff and you don't do that anymore, doesn't mean like that was wasted time. It just means like that's what you did and you're this now and you have all this stuff to back it up, you know? And we know that that's true because we had a speaker that was a chef and he ended up being one of the fathers of CGI. He oh, went from crazy. being a chef to creating, you know, basically what we know today is computer um, generated He images. went from things that you could enjoy in real life. To things you could act, <laughs> act like you were enjoying <laughs> the, in a virtual way. things that taste like almost nothing. Almost nothing. <laughs> so how does that, so when somebody comes up to you today at a party or something, and you're not trying to be funny, you're just trying to be serious, mm -hmm. what, and they say, oh, what do you do, Mike? What, what do you do? How do you answer that question? I just say I'm a comedian now. And they go, but you're not very funny. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, um, but why that's, are we that's, even talking? That's going <laughs> to right, right, right. No, but that, that's, uh, how, what kind of reaction do you get when you say that to people? Um, usually, it, it all depends on the setting, but if I'm with like family or like people from home or not in Los Angeles or right, in a big right. city, when you tell people you're a comedian, you're like, oh, I'll we'll say you a joke. Oh, they get excited. I thought they were going to feel bad for you and go, oh, you're unemployed. Oh, okay. Um, mm, mm, they think you're part of Hollywood. It's and... real weird. I can't say, when people look at me, they think I'm unemployed, and that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> but like, 
it's always like I'm I'm used to that the weirdest possible conversation because if I say like I do YouTube stuff, that's right. another depending right. on who you're talking to, it's right. another three hour conversation. Yeah, you watch YouTube? Like, oh, you're a cat. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> oh, cool. You're a cat who found some pie, and yeah. now you have 15 million views. Yeah. Uh, like, no, nah, man. I put and then like they just think your whatever YouTube video that they've seen. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, oh, you fell off your bike onto some ice. So and you, now you live in Los Angeles. And you, so you find the easiest way is just to say I'm a professional comedian. Comedian. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my last question dovetails with being a comedian, being a musician, putting yourself out there. Um, another lesson for students. Any 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 words of wisdom on how you've dealt with the haters? Because no matter how good you are, no matter what you do, when you put yourself out there, there's going to be the trolls, the haters. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your strategy? I don't know if it's because. I kind of mm, am finding success when I'm older, and I was made fun of a lot when I was little. I just like, if I see a YouTube comment or like a negative tweet or whatever, it doesn't even really register. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that to be like above it or whatever, because I'm not. <laughs> like, you say something that hurts my feelings, I'm going to go back and try to hurt your feelings, and it's going to be awesome for a couple hours. You know? <laughs> um, but it really doesn't even register. Because, because they don't know you? Is that why? Because they just, don't know me. So yeah. I'm like, how could you even really hurt me? Right. You don't know anything about right. what I'm doing or where I came from or whatever. And then I'm like, consider the source. Because it's normally like, somebody leaves a hair comment on the internet. Their picture it. is not their picture. And their name <laughs> is not their name and address. You know, It's like an egg or it's like, right. uh, <laughs> like an emoji, like somebody an emoji or something like that. They're like, it's a beard, it's me. It's the heart emoji, but it has a beard, so you know it's me. <laughs> and then they say something I'm like, I'm going to be hurt by that person. Right, right. There's no way. Even in real life, somebody comes up to me and says something like, I could size you up. Like, you might be able to beat me up, but I'm not going to take offense to that. It's not even funny. Right. You know? Well, I think, I mean, you have to have that kind of thick skin. Because if, you know, you start a business, it's going to be a whole contingent of people that tell you it's not going to work, you're mm -hmm. going to fail. Some of them will tell you that because they don't want you to be hurt. Other people will tell you that because they're too scared to do it themselves. Yeah. And you just have to they say, maybe. They wish they had done it. Maybe. Like, yeah, they yeah, wish they had yeah, done yeah, it, yeah, right? Yeah. And you, I think you just have to kind of have the same attitude. Like, you don't even know me. You don't even know my venture. You don't really know why I'm doing this. Maybe I'm getting a lot more out of it besides the success as you defined it. Mm -hmm. And just go, go on. And, don't and with with the internet it is just it's a frightening place right you get attacked on the internet and it feels horrible you can allow it to feel horrible yeah but it's or like you can it's just your, say it's your life man. right right like uh, again <coughs> i'm not getting into anything specific but like people in general a lot of them are bummed out there's like this <coughs> uh, low hanging cloud of like kind of being bummed out right. right but then it's like you wake up and you're like well if being an American is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I'm not going to let whatever's going on my pursuit of happiness if that's my right as an American and as a human being. you know. So it's like, you'll figure out when you want to stop doing stuff. You'll figure out when you're sad. You don't need some anonymous person on the internet to be like, stop, because you have a lisp or whatever. It doesn't matter. You could do Delete your account, dude. Right, exactly. Like, cut your hair. Uh, you could do anything and be however you want, and like all your little nuances or whatever, they just they make you different from everybody else. I have this one friend, my friend Rusty, who talks about he's a beautiful musician, like amazing songwriter, but he has a gap in between his front two teeth, and that's like a target for internet people. But that's his thing. Like if you draw a character of Rusty, that's his thing, you know. And then he has that, and I could have this conversation, like, you got to go see my friend Rusty. He's a, a country singer or whatever he is, like, folk singer. Like, OK, how will I know it's him? <laughs> <laughs> well, he has this situation going on between his teeth. <laughs> and then it's kind of a defining characteristic. And in your mind, like, everyone has that thing. Like, that's why that person's not that person. That's why that person's not that person. And it's so easy to make that the thing that you attack. The superficial, yeah. Right. But that's the thing that makes you Different. Like, there are a million funny people. You're the funny dude with a gap between his teeth. You're David Letterman. And right. And you win. Exactly. Right. Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're in government. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think on that note, we'll end it. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What do I got, Tony? <laughs>